we like to call it the supernatural hour. And now, our hosts. Hey, welcome to the Supernatural Hour. This is your host, Raven. Hi, I'm Chad. This is Rogue. I'm Emmett. This is Doc. This is Jess. We are going to jump into our main topic, and I need to give a disclaimer on this main topic. We're going to talk about Jeffrey Dahmer. There are, you know, a couple documentaries out there that have become quite popular. And we kind of thought we would jump on that bandwagon, but in a different way. We do not want to glorify him or or what he did in any way. What he did was was terrible. Um, We want to kind of come at it at the angle of, you know, is this mental illness, demonic influence, or a little bit of both? If you've listened to us for any length of time, you know that uh, several podcasts ago we talked about determining, is it mental illness? Is it you know, possession, demonic influence, or a little bit of both, which comes first, you know. Does or a lot of both. Right. You know, does the dem- demonic influence present as mental illness? Does the mental illness bring in the demonic influence? Is it one? Is it the other? It is really, really, really hard to determine that. But, you know, we're not a true crime podcast. We don't necessarily want to, you know, just be ser- serial killers. But as Chad and I started watching this documentary, there's just a lot of things that popped up that made me think, you know what, we could do a podcast, you know, at this angle of discussing mental illness versus demonic influence. So that's that's kind of where we're going to go with this. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that I thought was very interesting was he doesn't even really recall or remember his second the second murder. Right. Well, let's let's kind of let's do give an overview. So Jeffrey Dahmer was born in 1960. Um, his first murder was in, when he was only 18 years old. He was actually really young. And he committed 17 murders between the years 1978 and 1991, when he was finally caught. He had homosexual tendencies, which during that time, you know, was really kind of shoved under the rug. You know, they it was not accepted at all in any way, shape, or form back in the day. And so, you know, he kept it kind of quiet. So most, you know, all of his victims were men, mostly younger. He would strangle, um, you know, necrophilia, uh, dismemberment, horrible, horrible things that even researching this just makes you sick to your stomach. Leaving their heads in the fridge? Yeah, yeah. We're, I don't want to go into too many details because it's, it's, they say he is the most prolific, most horrible, most violent, creepy serial killer in America to date. I remember at the time he gave Jay Leno material for weeks. Oh yeah. There's some shirts for sale on Facebook that I don't know, I think the families of these people are still alive. These are kind of tasteless and tacky. I mean, they're, they're yeah. clever but it's like, oh, I, I, I actually think it's too soon. I'm sure the, the members' families, you know, looking through Facebook are probably appalled. Um, I would be. Anyway. So one of these documentaries He's um, our tapes that he did and sat down with his um, defense attorney, you know, as she's talking to him and, you know, trying to figure out how they're going to defend him. He just said several different things where I thought, you know, he was actually diagnosed with several different uh, mental illnesses, and I wrote them down. The mental illnesses that he was officially diagnosed with were borderline personality disorder, Schizotypical personality disorder and psychotic disorder, along with necrophilia, which they also called paraphilia in some in some areas. And for him to do the things that he did, there's definitely some mental illnesses going on. And if you look at other serial killers, usually there's something really, really horrible that happened to them in their their younger years, but he really didn't have much. You know, the only really thing is it said maybe a little bit of neglect because his parents were going through, you know, a divorce and and work and, and stuff. But, you know, neglect, you know, it, it wasn't even that bad of neglect. You know, he had a grandmother that he actually was probably the only person he really, really cared for. Um, so it's not like he had anything super traumatic that happened to him in no, his but younger he, years. But he did get into, you know, when animals would die playing with them and you know he's fascinated with the death of animals and that kind of stuff too so you know there were there were some signs 
Yeah, and his dad actually felt a little bit bad because his dad was a scientist. And when he, you know, was kind of showing interest in these dead animals, the dad, you know, you're not going to think, hey, my son's a future serial killer. Maybe we shouldn't do this. He's just thinking that his son is interested in science, right? And so his dad showed him how to take a skeleton out of animals and bleach it to preserve the bones. The and, and dad's thinking, hey, father, son, scientific bonding time. And his dad did say that, you know, he, you know, later looking back, he's like, holy cow, I just enabled my son to do all these terrible things. He did get into alcoholism, uh, Jeffrey, and it caused him quite a few issues his whole life. Yeah, in fact, he was driven out of the, the military because of alcoholism. And he, he had to do it. Yep. And he had to drop out of um, school because of failing grades due to alcoholism. And so, you know, if we got, kind of want to start here of going to the hitting that, is it mental illness or demonic influence or both, could this be where it started? You know, because alcoholism, as, we've, as we talk about on our investigations, we always say, you know, no drugs or alcohol on this investigation and not because we're trying to be a big giant downer and party pooper. But if there's going to be a negative spirit, they always go after the low hanging fruit. And when I say low-hanging fruit, I always hesitate because it kind of has a negative connotation. All low-hanging fruit means, the way I say it, that just means it's the easiest to get. Right. It's like when you're picking fruit on a, on a tree. On it's, a tree. You, go, if you, you don't have to climb up the ladder to get it. Right. The, the fruit you're going to pick first is the stuff that you can just pick while you're standing there. And it's just as good as the fruit up at the top. Yep. You know, the fruit at the top, you got to get a ladder and climb up and hope you don't fall off and... Stand on your tippy toes and hope you're not going to die. But so the, you're just saying the easiest to get to. Exactly. When I say low-hanging fruit, it just means the stuff you can just stand there and get really easy. And that's, The most susceptible. Yes. That's what they're going to go for. Exactly. And, um, you know, so you could ask yourself, with all of his alcoholism and all of those related issues, is that something that could have attracted... You know, I mean, maybe he'd had all these mental illnesses, but could the alcoholism have attracted the demonic entity? that just helped further along the issues he already had. I think that's very pro very plausible. Anybody else want to throw anything in there? Well, you know, it's it's certainly not going to help him get better, you know. Alcoholism but, is it's a it's it's a hard thing to deal with, you know, uh, even if you don't have other issues. Exactly. I mean, if alcoholism is your only issue, it still causes a lot of problems. A random thing that I recently read, it was talking about, did the hernia surgery that he had growing up cause him to have a personality change? So I was like, okay. Um, apparently when he was like younger, he had some surgery and then, um, and then there was like a hit to his head somehow during that. I don't know. And then it, his dad said that he was like different. His like got a flatter personality afterwards. So I don't know, but apparently it was like when he was younger before the whole like animal stuff that he was doing. So I don't know. So he had head trauma. Yeah, that's what it said. He, oh, he got a, um, a hit to the head and it was like, it was a weird sentence. It was talking about like he had herner surgery and then he had a hit to the head, but uh, we're like how, I don't know. It was a very random. Yeah, that's article. kind of an offhanded remark. That, yeah. That, you know, head trauma can be very serious and, and change personalities drastically. Oh yeah, yeah, head trauma can can be weird and you mm -hmm. know, bodies just in and of themselves can be something that one person can withstand a bunch of stuff that can just totally you know, ruin somebody else. Yep. It just kind of depends on just I don't know, your genetic makeup and and everything going on in your head. So doc, have you had any thoughts on this? A frontal lobe injury could definitely cause personality changes. Uh, I'm not sure. It's interesting that they mentioned the surgery. Uh, in the surgery, I wouldn't expect a lot of head trauma for a hernia repair. But if there was something like anoxic brain injury, if there was some issue with anesthesia, I could see that definitely causing significant enough injury. He could have personality changes. I assume it's possible. That's interesting. Yeah, that comment just, he had a, a, a knock to the head. That's just, you really can't derive a lot from that. Uh, I mean, like, maybe that was someone trying to, like, find an excuse. Because like, I think it was, like, his dad or somebody. So it's like, you know, maybe they're like, well, maybe that's what happened. Yeah. yeah especially if there's no medical record of it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe more of an excuse. So, 
during the course of his um, his trial, which only lasted two weeks, because to his credit, and I'm not trying to make him out to be a saint, but to his credit, you know, once he got caught and he knew he was caught, he didn't deny anything. In fact, he tried to help identify everybody and, you know, get all of the victims identified with the police. It was very open about the things that he did. One of the interviews was quite interesting. He realized what he was doing was wrong. You know, he wasn't making excuses for it. He didn't, you know, try to, when I say cover it up, he certainly didn't want to get caught, but he didn't lie to the police about the different things that were going on, and he he did help that. And he wanted to go to trial because he wanted closure for the families, and he wanted, you know, he wasn't looking for notoriety for himself. It wasn't that kind of a thing, from what I could tell in the interviews, but he wanted... He wanted closure for, for the families. Right. You know, he was he was very open. Uh, his defense attorney has like 300 hours of tapes, you know, from interviews that they did. He vocalized a few times, um, you know, that, that he knew he was going to die for it, you know, and, and he seemed like he, like deep down he knew that what he did had, was wrong and he was prepared to to, you know, face the punishment, which ultimately, I heard a couple different things. I heard one place say 999 years, one place was like 957 years, but basically... Once you get over 900, it really doesn't matter too much. Yeah, you know, 899, maybe. (laughs) No, but, you know, but he he really didn't try to fight it at all. And, um, you know, they did say, you know, he's very cunning, very manipulative, very... I mean, because he, during, even before he got caught caught there were a couple of instances where he just really kind of snuck out of things yeah the one that was really interesting when the 14 year old boy got away there was a i think it was a vietnamese 14 year old boy got away and was running away and and the police had actually got the 14 year old boy and jeffrey dahmer convinced the police that had the boy that that was this was just you know homosexual lovers fight and that the boy was an adult and turned him back over to Right, and he was like bleeding in several places, and Dahmer had poked a hole in his skull and squirted hydrochloric acid in his brain. And the police still gave him back to Dahmer. Yeah, anyway. So interesting stuff. And that that boy that was killed, Dahmer had actually abused his brother earlier in his life. Yeah. So where I was kind of going at that angle, though, is... You know, you wonder, you know, did deep down he knew it was wrong? You know, was it him manipulating or was it a demonic entity that was manipulating at that point? You know, I mean, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe one of the things, one of the things I found interesting, I just watched an interview earlier today where, you know, A, he acknowledged what he was doing was wrong. And he said it was like an addiction. It was just something that he couldn't stop doing. Right. The word I heard him with on a lot was a compulsion. That he just had to do it. Right. And then the other thing that he talked about was this fantasy of having possession, absolute possession of his victims. Where he, you know, that's kind of where his whole idea of, you know, I can basically control them in death. And, you know, and while, while I'm killing them, I can absolutely dominate and control and have full possession of them. And he talks about objectifying uh, individuals. And he says it takes a lot to go from seeing individuals as human beings to just mere objects for pleasure and it's a you know it's not something that just happens instantly but uh that was his big thing was this uh this compulsion or this urge to just possess completely his victims right and the his almost last victim um the one that got away and you know notified police and ultimately got him caught mentioned and and he had mentioned too you know in the interviews but that uh you know he went to the house with with Dahmer you know for for the reasons um because Dahmer would usually you know entice them to come to his home for you know to to take pictures you know because he'd pay him a hundred dollars yeah you know he'd pay money tell him that he was a professional photographer this this last one that got away and got to the police he told him he says you know at, at one point he would get drunk and and that's another thing is he every killing that he did he was always drunk he had to get drunk to do it um so again does that you know leave him more open for some demonic influences but they also said that he kind of had this ritual 
which would be watching um, usually Exorcist three, but he also had a real fascination with the Emperor from Return of the Jedi. So much so because the Emperor has kind of yellow eyes that he would actually wear yellow contacts to emulate the Emperor because he just he wanted to personify evil. He wanted to be Satan and he even said that at one point he felt like he was carrying out Satan's work. But this, and I wrote his name down, I don't see where I have it, but this uh, this last almost victim said that while he was watching The Exorcist he would also rock back and forth and he would kind of chant in tongues. You know, is that something that he was just doing because of the mental illness or was he... You know, Full was, on possessed. Was he possessed? And a little from column A, a little from column B. Exactly. Well, did you uh, did you read about the altar that he was building out of the remains of his victims? Yes, and he had, there was a drawing of it, and he was going to sit in front of it in his black chair and meditate. And I'm sorry if I'm looking at 15 skulls of people that I have killed and eaten. I don't know that I'm going to be really in a relaxed state. But you know, that's me. It's very zen. Yeah, it's a, like you said, a table with a bunch of skulls on it, and then two full skeletons on either side of the table, one on either side, with, uh, that were painted. And that's one of the things I thought was interesting, is that he specifically in his drawing talked about painted skulls and the painted skeletons and having a black tablecloth, and, yeah, and using it as a an kind altar. of an altar to himself, yes, but a place where he could meditate, I thought was an odd term. Yeah. yeah, so he said so he could feel powerful and feel at home, he said. Hmm. So one of the interesting things about this last guy that got away, apparently he had started to handcuff him, and there was a handcuff uh, on his wrist, and the guy was able to get out the door and, and go down, and he got with the police. Police tried their key to take the handcuff off, and they couldn't, so they took uh, him back to Dahmer's apartment, Again, thinking this is a lover's spat or something like that. Not, you know, they asked him where the key was, and he said back in the bedroom. And they were still not really taking this when I say overly serious. They went into the back bedroom to get the key, and that's where they found skulls and things like that. And then all of a sudden, it was like, oh gosh, this is so much more than than we thought it was. They called in backup. They got you know a lot of help from that standpoint. They took Dahmer down to the station to interrogate him, and they were interrogating him, and he was being so honest about everything and answering all of their questions and just laying it all out, you know, what what had gone on, what he could remember over the last, what, 10 or 12 years, whatever it had been, and just trying to give him all the information he could. The detective didn't believe him until he found out, you know, that the policeman called up and said, no, there are, there are skulls, there yeah, the, are heads in the refrigerator. The first thing that they found, you know, when they went back into the bedroom to get the, the key, he had a, an open drawer in his dresser that had Polaroids of dismembered bodies. And one of the police officers, you know, one of the two police officers that was there just happened to notice it. And he took him out and he took him and showed him to the other police officer and said, these are for real. Yeah, and they were, they were in that room. I mm-hmm. mean... You know, this wasn't like something he'd got off the internet or through somewhere else. They were Polaroids that were taken in that in his room. Yep. Wow. Busted. Yep. So kind of going back to, um, Chad, you started to talk about it and then we got sidetracked. But the second murder that he he did, again, he was probably only 19 or 20 at that point. Because he, he killed his first victim at 18 and then he went for quite a long time before he killed the second one. But... With the second one, he was completely blacked out. And, you know, when he was being interviewed, he said, yeah, you know, he gave details of every single one, but he said the second one, I don't remember. He says, I woke up and, you know, his head was crushed and his chest was bloodied and crushed. um, And my arm, you know, was black and blue, but he says, I have zero recollection of what happened. Which is really interesting because he's so honest and forthright with every other victim. Yep. You know, there's no reason for him not to be honest about this one that it's it was a complete mystery to him you know it doesn't it wouldn't make sense to go well you know 16 of them here's all the gruesome things i did on number 17 i've got to hide something mm-hmm. was he was he an alcoholic at that time could it have been just an alcoholic blackout yes it possibly could, it could have been an alcoholic blackout but he doesn't even remember meeting up with the guy you know so it's you know Total again blank 
Yeah. I mean, it, he totally could be just a total blank because of the alcoholism. Or did he drink a lot and then opened himself up, you know, to be jumped into by a demonic entity? Um, because when people have been, you know, jumped into or possessed, they lose time. Yeah. You know, again, we don't know. But it's interesting to, to contemplate and wonder. So do we have some takeaways from this? Don't go home with men from the bar. <laughs> so one of the things, as I was kind of researching this angle, um, there's a fellow named uh, Brad Hambrick. Um, that's just bradhambrick.com backslash Dahmer, I believe is the website. And he said, Dahmer is someone for whom both demonic and subhuman explanations are strongly held. So it's not just my weird little brain that is trying to put things together. It's it's something. There are others. Mm-hmm. There are others. And one thing, and I don't want to make it sound like he's a saint, but while he was in prison, he was in prison for a short time. He was only there for about three years before he was killed. Maybe not even three, two and a half. He was killed by another inmate. And there was three of them, and the one inmate killed Dahmer and the other of the three. And he said, you know, that he had been called to do that work. But before that, Jeffrey Dahmer had gotten baptized and, you know, requested a Bible and um, became a born-again Christian, you know, and and I don't know, you know, I'm I'm sure that his family, if his families were listening to me, they would probably be like, you know, I don't even care, he's a horrible man, and and he, he did horrible, horrible things, but there's that part of me that thinks, you know, in the afterlife, he will pay for what he did, you know, but I, I do hope that at some point he, you know, tried to atone for what he did. I guess that's possible. Tall order. Yeah. yeah. Oh, while no. we were, while we were kind of discussing it, you mentioned, you know, the possibility of demonic possession. I just kind of thought of the parallels of Jeffrey Dahmer exhibiting demonic behavior, really. I mean, his urge to possess completely, right, to the point where he could consume his victims, literally consume his victims, could be likened to a demonic entity trying to possess an individual, really. Absolutely. Well, and then, you know, and I, I do think that deep down, you know, whatever his his reasons, you know, whether it was mental illness, whether it was demonic possession, whether it was both, I think deep down he knew that what he was doing was wrong. He even in the interview said... He knew it. He was just, it was just that compulsion. Mm-hmm. But he did say, you know, the only person that can save me from this is Jesus Christ. And, the, and those are his own words. You know, and I don't know how saved he can be based on what he did. But, you know, he, he did acknowledge that. And he, from the get-go, he always took responsibility, responsibility for what he did. for his actions. You know, he never blamed it or tried to hide it. Well, he tried to hide it before he got caught. But yeah, after well, he got after caught, he got caught, it was like, no, you know. We'll just, we're going to lay it all out. And I think in probably in a way, just listening to the, the little bits that he did, it was almost like he was relieved mm-hmm. that he got caught. With compulsions, you don't necessarily want to do the things that you're compelled to do. Yeah. But you can't, said, you can't help it. Yeah, when he was in the military, I mean, he went almost eight years between murders. I mean, he didn't have a murder while he was in Germany. And they asked him, you know, well why didn't you kill anybody during that time period? And he said, it just wasn't feasible. It wasn't physically possible. It's not that I didn't have the urges to do it. I was in the military where my activities are tracked pretty closely. Uh, pretty closely. Uh, and so, you know, he said, I had the urges to do it. I just never had the opportunity. I never had the opportunity to do it. Exactly. Anyway, just some things to think about. I think we need to move on from him. He's creepy. Do something a little lighter. Yes. All right. Stay spooky, my haunty friends. Have a good night. Love you, Nicholas. See you next time. Have a nice night. Bye. You've been listening to The Supernatural Hour at advancedparanormal.com. The Supernatural Hour is part of the Radio Ronin Network found at radioronin.com. Copyright by Advanced Paranormal Services.